Once again, we thank you for the dew of your presence that activates our spirit, tunes our receptacles to be able to connect with your frequency of transmission. We ask this morning, Lord, that you go beyond the limitations of the sound, the connection, and do your goodwill and make for yourself a great name. In Jesus' mighty name. You are blessed and welcome to the house of God. You might be seated. When we talk about the spirit of life, it's a huge operating system that we are referring to. A huge operating system that um, is quite complex uh, and quite vast. However, hallelujah, this place is hot. Can we see what we can do to the air conditioning system? Amen. However, we would want to commence as uh, we look upon an aspect of this great theme uh, for this month. So if you need a title for the little presentation I want to do, we want to consider what we call the economy of gifts. The economy of gifts. There are several things that you will never have the capacity to pay for. God has decided to make it a gift. So there is an economy of gifts in the New Testament powered by the spirit of life. I'd like you to turn your Bible to the uh, book of Ephesians chapter 4. Now it's... Um, hallelujah. At some point, maybe during the course of this year, we need to do a school of ministry so that um, we can equip the children of God as to what it takes to be in the Lord's service and the resources that are at our disposal to prosecute and to deploy accurate kingdom service within the context of our ordinations. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, which I would like to draw attention to, the Bible says, and he gave some, okay, now let's do it from, uh, mm, okay, can we do it from verse 8, or oh, no, verse 8 is not, alright, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's the verse 6 is quite loaded, uh, but because of the time we may not be able to fully prosecute it. It's a it's a, an, an organic system, an organic system that is being described in the book of Ephesians 4 verse 6, which we may not have the time to look upon right now. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Um, according to their dynamics and parameters. Uh, that that scripture refers to which we might uh, consider when we are doing the school of ministry you say it's a it's a unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ that is to say we have received grace in measures and the source of grace is Christ that is in us the source of grace is Christ that is in us and Christ in us as ordained by God, according to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30, um, is the medium through which God will solve and satisfy all human challenges. However, we do not have time to still break into that, that space right now. Now the Bible also says, wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. He ascended on high. Now he did not dispense the gifts while he was still on earth. He had to ascend first 
before he deployed the gift from the pedestal of his ascension. Are you still with me? Oh my, you're not. You're not with me. You see, there's an economy of gifts I'm trying to show us. There's an economy. Alright? There is, there is an investment of gifts in the New Testament. New covenant and uh, this investment of gifts are resources that we do not have the capacity to procure that are required for the deployment of our essence upon the face of the earth so what god did was that he decided to make these resources a gift to us and uh, this gift is the basis upon which we live and we serve god for instance you cannot serve god acceptably without a gift there are several categories of gifts that we have in this context, in this testament. And um, just like I said, we are considering the economy of gifts. And we saw there is a first layer of giftings that has to do with uh, the gifts that we receive on the account of the measure of grace that is at work in our lives. You see, I don't want to go into that now. But that's a layer. Second layer is um, the ascension gifts these ascension gifts are hidden within uh, the functional operative kingdom status of men these gifts are unique and we need to look at it in 15 minutes before I shut down hallelujah unique we run on an economy of gifts you must have heard my story before I was born a stammerer. I couldn't say a word. I was next to dumb. All right? A little intelligent, but almost unable to give vocal expression to my thoughts. And uh, it was a gift I received from God that took care of this limitation. We are a bundle of limitations as members of the human race. And what God did is that he created us with limitations in the natural so that we can find sufficiency in him. And that's why he has made a location for his spirit to tabernacle everyone that has come to acknowledge the work of the cross. Hallelujah. It is because he is going to be the driver of your vessel. Yes, that is how you find sufficiency in the economy that is driven by the spirit of god and i'm saying that in that same economy there are several things that you cannot pay for that you don't have the capacity to pay for that you have access to and that is what i call the economy of gifts hallelujah i say hallelujah Amen. now and I, I, I'm, there are different gifts different kinds of gifts that we um, have access to in this covenant but um, my emphasis for the little charge I want to present to us is tied to the gifts of men this kind of gift this kind of gift is um, is bound to the person's identity spiritually so you cannot separate it from the person uh, it is it's a critical investment of God Okay, now let's look at it again. Uh, the Bible says in verse 8, that's where we are. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That the gifts are the things we see in verse uh, 11. And he gave some apostles. That's, that's what he's talking about. He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelist gave some pastors gave some what now notice something that jesus had to ascend first when we tell the story of jesus we can tell talk about his birth we can talk about his human living we can talk about his death we can talk about his burial we can talk about his resurrection mighty things happen as he entered into these different category of epochs in his life but in order for him to give this kind of gift, this gift I'm talking about, he had to ascend first. Now, what's the implication of ascension?
Yes, I thought somebody was coming to the rescue there. Uh, Pastor George, uh, because, were you trying to respond? <laughs> I saw a hand. Ascension. Now, Jesus did not give the gifts when he was here. You didn't say, uh, come and take, and then laid hands, laid hands, laid. He, he waited first. He died. He was buried. He resurrected. As powerful as he was when resurrected, he was appearing, entering into rooms without the, needing to use the door. He didn't give the gifts then. He ascended first before he gave this gift. Yes. Um, ST is coming to the rescue. Please help out with the microphone. It's, uh, I didn't do it. Meanwhile, I have a friend of a friend here. He is going to take um, take us further when I'm done with my little presentation. Uh, it's my friend, an evangelist from all the way from Brazil. As you are seeing, this man is is a missionary. He's a missionary. He's evangelist Peter, and you'll be seeing him again and again. We welcome you all the way from Brazil. God bless you in Jesus' name. Yes, sister. Why did Jesus? Have to ascend before he gave these gifts. He led captivity captive. Can you explain what that means? Put some life on this microphone in Jesus' name. All right. <laughs> Can you explain what the Bible means when it says he led captivity captive? And then he gave gifts from the standpoint of an ascended status. All right. So, you know, the morning session affords us some more time to look at scriptures, try to understand the mind of God, and also enter into the workability of several systems that God has set in motion. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. My understanding is, I'm not adding captivity. Yeah, he led. He led captivity. That scripture has been a bone of contention. In the body he led of captivity he, captive. He led Actually, captivity. I understand it from the standpoint of the fall. When man fell, the humanity became captive, as it were, oh. to the powers of darkness and all of that. And Christ came and he led that power. He led the prince of the power of the air. That one that had power, captivity, you know, the, the power of captivity, he led him captive. That is, he took the authority. Now, what she's saying is that captivity, according to the scripture, is a personality. Are you with me? You see, I don't have time. I don't have time. But, please, that's captivity in that scripture. Because, you know, you have been trying to imagine uh, captivity... It's a personality. It's a personality that prides himself with the power to be a captor. Right? Many times when spirits are identified in scripture, um, they are normally identified with verbs. Normally. Sometimes with nouns and most times with verbs. Because uh, the last time we checked, a verb is a doing word. A verb is an action word. Now, so these spirits are identified on the lines of their action. A spirit of effemity. That's what it does. An unclean spirit. That's what it does. That's what is responsible for masturbation, responsible for all kinds of things that people are ashamed to talk about on the streets because it's not decent all right so this these are the abilities that the spirit has so they are normally referred to using verbs are you still with me and so this entity that is referred to here is is a captor huh? he has a neck I, I don't want to go. <laughs> just, just, just go on, just go on. Praise the Lord. So that that captor, that you know, when you watch some those films of Arabian people that slave um, traders, slave, slave riders, and all, and then the people that are gifted in capturing slaves, 
tying them and flogging them and taking them to where they are sold, slave markets and things like that. That it is always wonderful to see the day they will be captured. The ones that are expert captors. So that's what happened there. He led him that is called captivity. He led him captive. Okay, go on. Okay. Praise the Lord. And so, what Christ was doing there, Jesus is our high priest. Christ is our high priest. So, if we remember in the Old Testament, when the high priest approaches the Holy of Holies, nobody touches him. He goes in there, he performs his sacrifice first for himself and then for the people. And when God accepts the sacrifice, there is a blessing that comes. But if God doesn't accept the sacrifice, the high priest dies and a curse is released on the land. Nobody could receive anything from God on account that Jesus had not yet opened the door, as it were, in salvation. So when he came, that was why he told Mary, don't touch me. Because what he was enacting was he was taking his blood to the Father to present it as the high priest would do. And so when Mary saw him, he was not supposed to see anybody. But because that ship was so stressed, he had to come and assure her that all is well, I'm still coming. But he wouldn't let her touch him. So he presented his blood. He had to ascend to present his blood. On that basis, he gives and comes because God accepts his blood. It's like the high priest has presented and the blessings come. So are you, are you seeing what is work, the economy that is working out in that school? Uh, and that's why, you know, Paul gave this comment assuming that you know the background the back end of the software all right so the blood was presented the blood was accepted and then the next thing to follow are blessings and these blessings came in form of gifts you know the bible reads he gave gifts unto men hmm? If you read it in the original translation, it's also accurate to say he gave the gifts of men. So these gifts are in men, and because these gifts are in men, he can now present these men as gifts to the body of Christ. Now, you see, that level, that layer, that reality, that context of gifts, which is one of the applications of spirit life and spirit reality is what i want to talk about hallelujah so it is those gifts that is responsible for what we now see in verse 11 that talks about the office of the apostle the office of the prophet the office of the teacher and the office of the pastor five things about that gift first thing about the ascension gifts that Jesus released from the ascension position. And one other thing I need to add to the ascension reality is um, um, how that uh, the ascension context is beyond battles, is beyond victory, is beyond conquering. You see, he first led captivity captive. That's the first thing, all right? So he went beyond that in order for him to give, give some to men. Are you with me? Now, if you operate within the scope of the ascension gifts, now, you see, today, I was very polite yesterday when people were allowing their phones ring throughout the service. It's forbidden. It's an abomination here in this house. You may do it somewhere else. Do it in the mosque do it in the market. If you do it here, it's an abomination. It's actually, it can, it can attract terrible, strange visitations. And you must be aware of that. Okay. Yesterday was a free day for lasciviousness and lawlessness was allowed. Today, such will be meted out, will meet with strange visitations. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Now, <laughs> so when we talk about ascension, it's a state that, that uh, a realm 
that Jesus operated for from after battles. So the ascension level is battle free. Are you with me? It's beyond the battle. It's after the battle. That's where he threw the gift from. Now, if you are operating with this ascension gift, are you with me? The ascension gift will actually validate the fact that what you have received is beyond the battle. Let me explain now. Let's say we have someone sick, someone terribly sick, and um, someone comes with an ascension gift, something from that, you know, that gift was given after victory was already secured. The manifestation of that gift will show that this victory was, it will reveal the fact that Satan was conquered initially. Do you understand? Because the gift was released after conquering was achieved. The manifestation of the gift will also advertise its superiority over the kingdom of darkness. That's why Jesus had to go up there and then from that vantage position he deployed it. If we function in it, it will provide evidence that is operating from a place, from a realm, a realm that has conquered the devil. Alright? That will be evident in your current experience because you are operating with an ascension material. Now, the Bible says he gave gifts unto men. And you know the list. Prophets, apostle, teacher, pastor. First of all, uh, in the economy of gifts, I need to say something about this ascension gift, this ascension apparatus that God has bestowed upon us, with which he intends us to establish his kingdom upon the face of the earth. Ascension gifts are tied to a call. I need to explain that. Ascension gifts are what? They are tied to a call. Now we need to understand how important a call is in the kingdom of God. A call. It's an expression of an ordination. It's a revelation of something that was captured within the context of God's counsel. A call is the definition of the essence of a thing. Hallelujah. Now, I did not know who I was. And I did not know what I was to God. I started discovering who I was when I began to study the Bible. Then I realized that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the called. I am the healed. There are several things you can find about your current status by Bible study. Which are good. They are general for every Christian. But if you are going to find the specifics of your reality from the perspective of God, you have to interface with Christ himself. It is from Christ, according to the book of Colossians 1 verse 17, that everything gains its definition, gains its relevance, gains its essence. So if you have not interfaced with Christ, you don't know your relevance. You don't have a definition. You don't have an essence. And if the devil finds out you are without essence, what he does is that he gives you a definition. He gives you a mission. He gives you his own kind of essence. And that becomes the blindfold that he keeps you under in your pilgrimage through this life. So you have to interface with Christ. And in interfacing with Christ you have to develop a personal relationship with him in order for you to access his layer. When you access his layer then your essence with respect to specifics that is captured in the documents of heaven will now be disclosed to you. But what it takes for you to be called is a specific and a direct encounter with Jesus where he assigns you. Being that he is the Lord of the harvest that sends laborers into his work field 
Jesus himself will have to assign you. Right? Jesus normally assigns you in keeping with an ascension deposit. Your assignment is consistent with an ascension deposit. For instance, I never knew I was called into the office of the apostle. But when I began to interface with Jesus, he, he began to send me on several errands. And I was errands to do stuff, errands to do this, errands to do that. All of those errands, he was checking my faithfulness. And then a time came where it was disclosed that, okay, this is who you are by design. Hallelujah. Now, you see, when I, because the first thing when I discovered, when God spoke to me that he had called me to be an apostle, there was a challenge. The challenge was, who is an apostle? How does he operate? Hey, this is a big thing. Because I did not have enough schooling to know what it entailed. But you see, what I did not know is that it is not something of head knowledge. It is an immortal reality. And it flows from a gift. Hallelujah. Now, evangelist Peter is an evangelist. If he begins to serve God, the dimensions of his deposit will naturally flow out. Just like you don't teach a dog how to bark. You don't teach a teacher how to teach. Someone that is called to teach, you don't need to teach him how to teach. It will flow out of his vessel. You can teach him how to arrange his thoughts. You can teach him how to set um, the sequence of his thoughts. But there's an inherent capacity to teach that is tied to his calling. If he wants to express himself, he will express himself as a teacher. Are you with me? If an evangelist wants to express himself, an evangelist will express himself as an evangelist. If his lines of bodings, his lines of emphasis, his lines of, 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 of concentration will already give him away because this ascension gift is tied to his calling. That's the first thing. Second thing is that this ascension gift is revealed as you set Jesus in line with his will. Many people have asked, Oh my, how I prophesy sometimes it comes to pass. I want to know if I'm a prophet. You are in the wrong place. I did not, I was not striving to know if I was an apostle or a teacher. What I was striving to do was to know the next instruction in line with his service and to deploy myself to satisfy and to prosecute that mission. And as I got doing that. I got stuck with that. I got stuck with that. I, I, I kept doing that. I kept doing that. I have a track record of, of Christian service. A track record. Christian service. Somebody that has not labored. You have not labored up to 14 years. And you are expecting to incidentally just know that you are called to be an evangelist. If you see somebody that claims to know that he's a prophet too early, he's fake. Is fake. Because if you have not served in the kingdom for up to 10 years, you don't even have the right to claim that you are something. If we don't have a steady record of Christian service for up to one decade, you will be fraud to be up on the street claiming that you have a particular title. You see, people have made a mess of ministry. You saw the other days on Facebook, you saw all kinds of things. You know, hallelujah. I say hallelujah. So people like Watch Money, people that were given to the art of building the body of Christ. They said it that if you have not, if you don't have at least ten years of experience in kingdom service, go about with a learner badge. You know when people start driving newly, in order to save motorists and all other people that might need to use the road, they are enjoined to put a sign L. L means I'm dangerous to you and you are dangerous to me. I'm a danger looking for where to happen. That's how it is. A man that has not committed up to 10 years of service, if he becomes a preacher, he is a dangerous entity. If he's elevated too quickly, he will be destroyed. 
Because he doesn't understand the principle that govern immortal things. You see, I know you may, you, maybe you drove here in a Toyota Matrix uh, vehicle. And that's an achievement where you were, where you come from. In, in Nepal, it's an achievement. For you to show up with, if you drive Matrix there, it's all, oh, ah, our son has come back. It's quite, it can be an achievement. But you see, that will not impress immortals. To not impress spirits that are ancient. That's a physical thing. It's a physical stuff. If you are going to impress the mortals, you must adopt what we call the culture of sacrifice. When you go beyond yourself, you, there's no profit. There's nothing for you to gain in that venture. But you are stuck there because you know that is how to serve the will of God. The mortals are moved by sacrifice. If it doesn't cost you anything, forget about it. It's only time-based. And it's, it was orchestrated for vain glory. But if it's going to go beyond, I think it's very difficult for you guys to do what you do. You, for rehearsals, all of that. If sacrifice is in it, then it has struck a chord in the realm of the immortals. You don't know how many kilometers we do per year on the road preaching the gospel. You can't even imagine. Or how much we spend by flight connecting different places all through the year. I was counting boarding passes the other day. For one year. It, you know there are 52 weeks. There are 52 weeks in a year. Alright? I have 38 boarding passes. That is then not to talk of the cost. You know, when you get, when you enroll to serve Jesus, it's, it's on the platform of sacrifice. The time comes, if you linger in sacrifice, it will become normal, natural for you to live that life. The reason why it is natural is not because you change, it's because more measures were given to you and he, you now operate beyond the flesh limit consistently. That's how strong men are made. So the disclosure of your identity comes into limelight when you are recklessly serving God in line with his will. Many people are serving God, but not in line with his will. Sometimes God wants you to sit in a place and be an intercessor. And the person believes that that is an obscure place. He needs a platform. He needs to be shouting to the nations. His voice must be heard. Uh, for such a person, what God does to him is that he hides him permanently. He is hidden. With all your effort, you, you are on Facebook say, I'm here! I'm here! Nobody will notice that you are in motion. He will hide you. <laughs> I know you don't uh, like my talk, but um, that is, you see, we have we have matured now, so we need to be telling you the way it is. There must be a record of selfless service, services that you deployed, and there was no recompense in view. People that you helped that don't have the ability to help you. It's only a calling that can make a man be such a blessing. Not because humans are good, not because we are good, but the one that sent us is good. And that's why goodness flows through us. Not because we, we are terrible people, but he that sent us, he is, he is a good one. Hallelujah. You notice one guy came to Jesus and said, good master, what shall we do to inherit the kingdom of God? He felt that was a wonderful salutation. Jesus rejected it. Jesus said, call no man good but God. You know what you meant by that? Because the guy was saying, you are good. No, good is relative. If, if we don't have a reference for good, then it is relative. Then among homosexuals, there, there, there can be a good. Among thieves, there can be a good thief. Among... So, it becomes an open-ended thing. Jesus stopped him. I said, called no man good but God. Are you with me? What Jesus was trying to get the guy to understand... Is that um, um, any good that is not of God is not even good in the first place. However, for me, I am not God because I'm good. But I am good because I'm God. My goodness flows out of my nature. So if we cannot tie good to the nature of God as a definition, then we'll have 
relativism in the context and will not know what good is again. Because a brother came in the body of Christ in Nigeria the other time and said, if it is God, if it is good, then it is God. That's Antichrist doctrine. That's the same kind of thing that Satan preached in the Garden of Eden. And because the person is a bishop, so many people started subscribing. And that's how the souls of many people became living. Because reality left. The only good we have is God. That which flows from God is, is, is that which is good. Because Satan spoke about a good that was not God. Knowledge of good and evil. That was the introduction of relativism. These are new age concepts. But are they really new? They are not new. Satan has been playing with the minds of men using these integers for a very long time. So you are going to get locked up in the service of Jesus. Selfless service of Jesus that is consistent with his will. Um, before some of those disclosures are made. Number three. This gift is so tied to your personality that you can be identified with it. The ascension gift. For instance, I can, I can say apostle. Alright? And I'll be right. You see, that gift is tied, forms his personality, is tied to his personality. If he goes to the, to the supermarket, he's still an apostle. If he goes to school, he's an apostle. He goes to the hospital, he's an apostle. An evangelist in the market, still an evangelist. If he goes to Moscow, he's still an evangelist. Hallelujah. Because that gift is interesting with his personality. Are you, are you with me? Now, so we can call him apostle, but we cannot call him Mr. Prophecy. You see, the gift of prophecy, for instance, is not personalized. But this gift is so unique to you that it becomes part of your identity. It's part of your identity. Alright? Okay. Number three, as I four. This gift is a direct, it's a direct investment that Jesus makes to his body primarily. It's a direct investment. Just like God smuggled Moses into the house of Pharaoh. And as far as he was concerned, the deal was done. It will only take time. In the fullness of time, the sorcery, the mercenary, the necromancy that was part of the civilization of that land was going to crumble because Moses has arrived. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. So when you, you put a prophet somewhere, the more you suffer him, the more you suffer him, as long as he doesn't break his link with God, the suffering will help him death and look very well. The things that you think you will do to somebody to get him discouraged are the very things you will do that will get this person developed. Relegating to the background. You may not know, but in this town, I was saying, staying with um, someone that my parents helped many years ago. My parents helped that person. The person came into Lamb Line. So I was schooling in BSU. And then they said I should stay with the person for one session. Instead, when I just arrived, they welcomed me, gave me a room in the boys' quarter, and told me that in this house, the children don't walk home. So I had to take wheelbarrow in this town to go and fetch water. Early in the morning, first for the house. Because I don't know what water board did that uh, water doesn't come. So I, I, I do wheelbarrow push. Get water. You see? The more I was doing, I was doing that with tongues. Yeah. Hallelujah. The things you will do to get somebody discouraged. If you can afford to be discouraged, you have not seen, you don't know the power of Christ in you. Because with Christ in you, mortality itself is a light burden to bear. It's a light burden. On the strength of this gift, nobody can really do damage to you that doesn't have the capacity to affect that gift that is with you. It's an ascension property. Space and time cannot cripple it. If you know the power of the investment, you will survive on another level. 
The things that will cripple others will fertilize you. The things that will kill others will give you life. The things that will subdue people will give you empowerment. Finally. Finally, it is a gift from God that will make you who God wants you to be. Now listen. If you have seen the chapter of the eternal purpose, you will find out that one of the things God, one of the goals that God wants to achieve in the life of a believer is that He wants him to attain Christ likeness. You know, where to attain unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ likeness. He's the pattern man. And we all have a deposit of his life, his essence in us. It's just like when you go, maybe your Honda car, the engine goes bad, and then you take a Pe- Peugeot 406 engine and you put it inside. Performance is supposed to be Peugeot. No longer you have Honda body, but because of the engine that is driving it, performance is supposed to be Peugeot performance. And so God decided to release very essence of Christ into us with a view that we will eventually achieve a measure of the expression of the personality of Christ. So your calling and in that gift that you received is what has separated you onto a particular path. And the path that you have been separated onto has attendant challenges that will bring you under pressure such that you have no way of escape except you connect with God. And it is littered around that path so meticulously that as you walk the path of that unique calling, you eventually turn out to achieve the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is through that gift that God makes you what he wants you to be. You get that? Through that gift. If I'm consistent with God, there is no way my life can turn out differently. We have a lot of preachers who are raising people and they are not looking like Christ. They are looking like thieves, demons, looking like all kinds of stuff. Then you know that uh, uh, there is a, there's a problem with the disciples. There's a systemic error. It's systemic. Systemic. I don't have time to touch the kind of doctrinal diseases that can produce different expectations other than that which God has. They are doctrinal diseases. And that's why you must be well grounded in the things of truth. Every investment you make to get yourself grounded is not a waste of time. If you take off like a tornado, God will hide you until you, you are old. And I've seen so many people that were hidden by God deliberately. It was God's initiative. It was a policy direction. Angels were dispatched to administer that policy. To ensure that some people were hidden. Their voice was never heard. Meanwhile, they were shouting in the street, but nobody help them. Even the boss, they'll go and say, hey! When people come out of the bus, something just makes sure that the thing they say, they're forgetting. It doesn't linger, it doesn't stay. Because they have been sentenced to a time of hiding. Finally. If we are going to be in the Lord's service to represent Him in this age and time, a few things we need to know about the Lord. The Lord knows too much. The Bible says that He knows what I have framed. He knows your dimension, your coupling. He knows how much temptation you can handle. He knows the circumstances you are not likely to survive. At any point you become smart, you will be hidden. Smart as to determine where you will be next, determine how you will navigate, determine. Ah, if you become that smart, he will ensure that you exist.